Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Alexandra Hudson. I will tell you all about Alexandra in just a moment. Grace Under Pressure is that show that deals so often with which with stuff which dismissed as the soft stuff, the caring, the commitment we exert toward others. And you will learn that when you do it from a leadership position, as um, Alexa will tell us, you do it for, for common cause to bring people together. So welcome, Alexa Hudson. So, Thanks for having me, John. Thrilled to be here. Well, the reason you are here is because you have a fabulous underlined fabulous new book called Soul of Civility. Um, frankly, you should be doing this show <laughs> because we so often write about uh, the same things, but you have such a depth uh, in perspective of this book, and I want to explore that. It is just, uh, I am so totally charmed by it. The name of the book is Soul of Civility, Timeless Principles to Heal Our Society and Ourselves. And Jonathan Haidt gave you a nice endorsement that is hits the nail on the head for me. And it's, he said, it's beautifully written and meditative. So, and I was so excited about this, I forgot to tell people about your background. <laughs> you are a storyteller and you teach storyteller. Uh, you are a popular speaker. A, you're a founder of Civic Renaissance, a public uh, publication and intellectual community dedicated to beauty, goodness, and truth. What's better than that? <laughs> you were named in 2020 a Novak Journalism uh, Fellow. You contribute to CBS News, Fox News, Wall Street Journal, and, used, and so many other publications. You also teach at uh, Indiana University uh, in the Lilly School of Philanthropy. Uh, Alexa Hudson, it is a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thanks so. for having me. Great. Now let's jump right in. Let's take a step back. You teach storytelling. Why is storytelling so important to us adults? We are storytelling animals, you know, that we we learn the world through stories when we're young and we never stop understanding the world through stories. Um, it's how we understand who we are, what it means to be human, what our place is. In the world is that everything around us every day, it's like the air we breathe. It is, it is storytelling. And so in my series for the great courses, I explore what it means to be human, what, what, it, what it means to lead a meaningful life through great stories across history and culture to the end of helping us understand more about ourselves, more about our vision of the life well lived and contextualizing it with how other people in other times and places have as well. And, and, to, and to help us tell better stories about ourselves, stories of meaning, stories of purpose, of, of destiny that enrich our lives here in the present now. And that's really the crux of my entire work, reviving the wisdom of the past to help us lead better lives today. Great. And, and it's a, uh, a, a thumbnail sketch, really, of your book. And I've read a lot of different things, philosophy, theology, all of that. But I've never read a book that quotes both goes from the story of Gilgama, uh, Gilgamesh, uh, which is in Babylonian times, to Curb Your Enthusiasm with Larry David. Now that is a span. So and we, your focus is the book, Soul of Civility. We know civility. We're human beings. Since Babylonian times, we've had civilization and all that. So what's so hard about practicing civility? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really interesting that this is a timeless problem. This is the most important question of our day. How do we flourish across deep difference? But this is also a, a question we've been grappling with as long as we've been around as a species. Uh, this is because human nature doesn't change. We are profoundly social as a species. We become fully human in relationship with others, and yet morally and biologically, we are driven to meet our own needs before others. And these two facets of who we are our intention, the love of others and love of self. And that is why um, this is this has always been a problem. It always will be. That's the value add I think my book brings to this conversation. It's really seductive and tempting to blame others. Um, you know, whether it's Elon Musk and the algorithm, whether it's Donald Trump, whether it's, um, you know, COVID and technology, like whatever it is, it's really easy to externalize 
this problem, this challenge and its causes. And there's no question that certain epiphenomena, external changes exacerbate the problem, but the origin, the root cause is within each of us. It's this duality, this tension within the human personality that we all share that ensures this thing called democracy, civilization, friendship itself will always be fragile. It's never a foregone conclusion. It really depends on each of us in the everyday to act with civility in ways great and small to consider the well-being and needs of others alongside of ourselves. So well put. And uh, but just for the record, um, we're not talking about me or you. It's other people. So <laughs> that's right. It's not us. We're the, we're, yeah. we're 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 exempt from. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned the word flourishing, and I see it now in, in, in contemporary management literature. What is flourishing? How does it manifest itself? And if if it's worthwhile, how can we practice it? So. Yes. What is human flourishing? It's 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 that's tied in intimately with this question, this timeless question that that thoughtful people across time and place have grappled with is what is the good life? What is the best life? What is the life well lived? And people remarkably across time and place have come to similar ideas about the timeless principles of human flourishing, about the tenets of the good life. And this involves intimately life with others, that like life with others is incredibly hard. It is often vexing and frustrating. There are times where I just think to myself, I need to withdraw from society entirely and homestead with my family on the farm where I don't have to deal with other people, you know, but, you know, most of us don't do that. We don't have the luxury because, because life together is, is, is good. It is, it is the best life, life and community. It's not just most conducive to survival, you know, and mutual cooperation and collaboration, but really to flourish as well. So we need others to, to survive and flourish, but it's, it's not easy. Great. I'm glad you used the phrase, the good life. Uh, a recent guest of mine is um, Dr. Robert Waldinger, who is the co-director co of the Harvard Adult Study, the longest study of happiness that's been going on for 85 years. And his new book, uh, with he co which he co-authored uh, with Mark Schultz, is The Good Life. And it comes down to one phrase, positive relationships. And yeah. I think that's what you were talking about is, you know, you said you want a homestead. But I, I will extend the metaphor to homesteading is what we can do in our own communities. Would you agree with that, uh, Lexi? So. That is absolutely my theory of social change, that we can't change the world. We can't even really control what others do, but we can change ourselves. And that we have way more power to be a part of the solution than we realize that our individual decisions to make the world around us better and more beautiful, that will change the world, that world will reclaim the soul of civility, and that will heal our souls and our, our society as well. Now I'm going to put you on the spot because we talk about you talk about personal change. I wholly agree with that. But here's the dilemma, Lexi. Um, I think change is just fine for you, Lexi. You need to do these things. I'm just fine the way I am. So <laughs> how do you deal with those kinds of challenges when people come to you and say X, Y, Z doesn't want to change or whatever? What suggestions do you have? So okay. this is the inherent um, tension of me personally choosing to write a book on civility, you know, that no one is perfect, not even me. And I fall short of my own ideals time and time again. And, you know, who am I to be telling other people how to live when I still fall short myself? And, you know, that that's really a core argument of my book that we are all going to fall short. I am. I'm the first to acknowledge that first, the first to recognize that. And I am not in any way setting myself up on a pedestal as someone who's got it all figured out. But I am someone who fails and continues to keep trying. And that's what we—that's all we can each do. Like I recognize that we're all going to fall short. And I, I love the phrase from Erasmus of Rotterdam, one of the heroes of civility in my book. He was an intellectual superstar of the 1500s in, in the European Renaissance. And he was a genius, absolute scholar, gentleman, genius, the most desirable dinner company in all of Europe. He traveled from court to court, kingdom to kingdom, and never spent two years in any one place because everyone just wanted him and he just had so many invitations and he wrote a book on civility one day he was walking down the street and he says that a youth greeted him with insufficient deference and he said okay that's it i'm going to write a book on manners to educate 
the, the children of today and, and proper etiquette and deference to so talk about the timelessness of the complaint about kids these days, you know? Oh. And, and so what um, Erasmus does, he writes this book on manners, civility. It's an international bestseller across Europe. It's translated into every European language. And he says, at the final maxim of his book is so insightful, so telling. He says, readily ignore the faults of others and avoid falling short yourself. And that's totally an inversion of what the world tells us to do, which is to blame others and exonerate ourselves. And Erasmus says, no, 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 turn that right around. Readily ignore the faults of others. Stop blaming them, forgive them freely, and do what we can to stop, to, to not be vexing, to not make life more difficult to others. That's all we can do. We're going to fall short. Others are going to fall short. We have to extend grace freely towards our others and ourselves. Very powerful. And just for the record, um, your book, as I'm a fan of it, it is not preachy. Um, I don't, I sense your commitment in it, but I don't sense you telling us what to do. You advise in a very, um, uh, it, it, it's a richness to it. And you do it through storytelling, but some also practical things I'll discuss in a minute. Now, what you just said about Erasmus um, is so powerful. And it's, you know, it's essentially the Christian thing is turn the other cheek. Every culture has that kind of thing. Don't take it personally. Well, that's easy, but what about our quote, anti-social media, where we play gotcha and algorithm driven or not, we're incited to anger. <laughs> so how am I going to deal with that, <laughs> Lexi? So. It's a great, it's a great um, uh, question that, that, you know, we live in an era where so much of our interaction is digitally mediated. And what do we do about that when we're when our primary mode of communication is it diminishes the humanity of the other and our ability to recognize the personhood? And we're kind of emboldened to act with um, act to act and, and do and say things that we otherwise wouldn't do. And that is um, that that's a challenge. I mean, there there are good things about digitally mediated communi communication, but uh, there are also challenges to it that, we, that we have to be mindful of. And my challenge to us in the book, to readers in the book is to um, do what we can to stay mindful of the dignity, personhood of the person on the other side of that text, the phone call, the email, right? It's really easy to, to just, you know, rotely, um, you know, spin, spin, spin something off and, and especially in the heat of a moment, if we're aggravated on social media, you know, but, but to instead, you know, take a pause, take a break, and then of course stay, you know, exercise our, our creative, faculties and remember that there is a person on the other, other end of this interaction and that we owe them a bare minimum of, of respect by virtue of our shared personhood. That's great. Now, there's an element in here and you write about it and I love how you do it. And uh, you talk about the admonishment. You do not admonish, um, but there's a concept of shame, of course. Um, and you to draw an example from two sources. One is the Paris Metro, and the other one <laughs> is Curb Your Enthusiasm. I have never read so uh, such an eloquent and uh, loving tribute to the cast and the characters of Curb, Curb Your Enthusiasm as you write about them. And um, so what captivated them about you? Uh, what captivated you about their behaviors, uh, Lexi? Larry David is... Um in the show Curb Your Enthusiasm, it's a comedy of manners. It is all about, um, you know, Larry Just Larry David is this like social justice warrior, but it's his version of social justice. Like what is justice in this social context? And he walks around in life. Uh, and this is why we love the show. He does and say that says the things out loud and confronts other people with the things that many of us notice, we just choose to let go. You know, so he's our inner, inner ego and our inner id. Like he just, you know, he has no shame and he's willing to call people out for minor social infractions, minor common indecencies. You know, the person who makes a mess at the Starbucks, you know, milk counter and just doesn't clean up. Larry's the one that would be like, excuse me, like put your garbage away, right? Like the person who double parks. Larry David's the one like that, that comes out and says, excuse me, get back in your car and park better. Like this is society, sir. You don't get to act with impunity. Like you're not on an island. Like you have to think, you know, operate with others in mind. And so on one hand, you know, we, we cheer him on because he calls people out for the common indecencies, common, common discourtesies that 
vex us, that make life really grating in our everyday. And yet at the same time, um, he he also is pretty petty. He's pretty petty. He's vindictive. Oh, do you think? <laughs> graceless, you know? And he just walks around with a level of like litigiousness that is actually not very good at society. We need like a few Larry Davids to keep the thoughtless, inconsiderate people, accountable people who are willing to call people out for for in, in, in indecencies and discourteousness that they think they can get away with. But too many Larry Davids like would not be good for society. We wouldn't want to do life together if everyone was walking around like you know demanding that everyone operate under their their auspices, their their definition of social justice and and, and the vision of that. That's always the because that's the conceit of the show, is that Larry himself falls short often of the very thing he's called someone out for. You know, very gracelessly at the end. So that you know, it's it's making fun of himself in that way, but it's. It's a great show. It's a comedy of manners. It's a great. And I call Larry David the foremost defender of civilization today. True. And and I love how you do it. And my, my theory is that Larry David, what you just described as Larry David, the person, Larry David, the character is the graceless schlep. And Larry doesn't, you know, he admits his own faults, but you wouldn't be able to do the show with or create a show for 12 years like that if he didn't have some self-awareness, although he claims he has none. <laughs> right. So, anyway, um, now, uh, but I mentioned the Paris Metro. There was something uh, with posters that were done and it had a positive effect can you, uh, related to manners. Do you recall what that was, uh, Lexi? Yeah, the, the, so I put three case studies in dialogue. Uh, Mayor Michael Bloomberg's uh, politeness campaign in New York, Tony Blair's respect campaign in London, and the Paris politeness campaign. Um, and so Michael Bloomberg, when he was mayor of New York City, decided that um, New York had reached a fever pitch of incivility and something had to be done. So he legislated uh, manners, essentially. You know, if you were texting at the movie theater, find $50. If you put your seat up on the subway seat next to you, find $50. If you were um, at your kid's softball game and too rambunctious, find $50. Uh, and, and I just like, you know, New Yorkers did not like being civilized by their local government. And so they, um, the, 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 the legislative protocol didn't work. They rolled it back, but and it was a total failure because thankfully New York City is not a totalitarian state where every, every single interaction is micromanaged. But amazingly, around the same time, a similar campaign uh, happened in, in London, Tony Blair's Respect campaign. And similar things were um, were rolled out, similar legislative proposals, only the most egregious example was if you were deemed a neighbor from hell, you could be um, have your property taken away from you. You could be evicted from your own property and have your property taken away from you. And so that did not last long either. An obvious, an obvious violation of civil liberties. You know, Paris took a, a, a different approach. They realized that they had a politeness problem. You know, just Parisians were annoyed. You know, it, it's kind of a stereotype of the rude Parisian, you know, that's not very customer service oriented. Americans and people around the world go there. They, they don't like being talked down to. And it's definitely not a customer is always right kind of culture that many in the West are accustomed to. And, you know, but but it wasn't just uh, tourists and outsiders complaining. It was, it was Parisians who were annoyed with one another of just common indecency in public places and settings. And so Paris City Council rolled out this whole politeness poster campaign that didn't use the force of law. It instead harnessed the power of social shame. And on the in the in the, on, on the poster campaign, it had, you know, uh, depictions of animals acting in really kind of inconsiderate and grotesque ways, you know, man spreading and littering. And, and it would say things like, don't be like this sloth who's, you know, sitting and, and taking up 10 seats on the thing. Don't be like this, you know, donkey who's, who's not picking up after himself. And it said, let's be civil down the line. And they're kind of cute and funny and people laughed at them, but it actually worked, you know, politeness and just common decency got better in Paris. And, um, uh, yeah, that's no. It's a wonderful story, and th and and thanks for fleshing that out with the Bloomberg example, which I was familiar with. I was not familiar with the Tony Blair and London, but <laughs> which uh, a little too severe. Sounds more Elizabethan than than twenty uh, first century. Uh, now, there's something else. What is 
in every chapter, um, you have these dictums or things for practice. And in one of your chapters, you have something on hospitality. And I love the concept of hospitality as it relates to civility. So tell, some will just say, oh, it's a, a nice to have. Take, what's your take on hospitality and how it relates to civility, Lexi? So. So, so hospitality is a high and noble expression of civility. It's civility in practice in many ways. And I, I tell the story of um, a slave in ancient Greece called Eumaeus to illustrate the power of civility and why it is this high and noble expression of hospitality. Eumaeus was this slave with um, nothing much in the way of material possessions or power. And one day though, even though he had very little, he encountered someone who appeared to have even less than he did. And what did he do? He offered him hospitality. He said, come into my home, stranger. Let me feed you. Let me bathe you. Let me clothe you. And only after he gave him a place to stay and rest and rejuvenate, he said, now tell me your story. You know, he didn't do these things with any expectation of, of getting anything in return. You know, he didn't, he wasn't, it wasn't a friend or a guest he was hoping to do business with. It was just a stranger who appeared to be in need and he welcomed him and provided for his basic needs. And he said, um, and then it was revealed that it was his long lost and beloved master, Odysseus, in disguise as a beggar. So, you know, obviously a person of great wealth and political power. Uh, and they have a beautiful reunion. Uh, Odysseus, who's been this stranger in need, tossed about from island to island, shipwreck to shipwreck, from monsters to goddesses to good, good hosts, bad hosts. He's, you know, the whole of the Odyssey and Homer's Odyssey is about hospitality and about the duties of a good guest, duties of a good host. It's all about civility and how we treat the other, the stranger. Uh, and, and um, you know, Odysseus is so thrilled to have discovered that his Eume his beloved Eumaeus, his supportive friend and, and, and slave and servant is a person of character and integrity because he showed him help even when he was in need, but didn't, didn't have anything to gain from doing so. And we see this trope of strangers in disguise across history, across culture, across literature, that this is just an objectively kind of universally agreed upon value to you, you show kindness and, and to the other, the stranger, the outgroup, the outsider, the person you may never see again, who will never do anything for, for you in return, just because they're a person like you in need. Full stop. And that's, that's it. No, it's a beautiful story, and it is repeated throughout literature and history. But what's interesting, the way you tell it, was that about the the um, the uh, character uh, Emmaus was taking care of uh, the guest, and he didn't ask any questions. He just met the immediate need. Then tell me your story. And I think we need more of that. Uh, call it open heartedness. Call it grace. You know, meet people where they are. Um, do you see that, Lexi? So. Exactly. Meeting people. This is the whole thing of what civility um, offers and promises, that the ability to be seen and known and loved in the fullness of who we are and that we each can lead our lives in a way that does that for others. That is our calling. That is our um, that is our um, our duty, you know, to, to and, and our opportunity to be agents of social healing. In our broken world, it can feel really disempowering. These problems around us seem so vast and so uh, intractable. And as we've discovered, timeless, right? Like the, this, this problem's not going away, but we can each do our part to be part of the solution and how we live our lives in the everyday. And again, choosing to take our cues from the Eumaeuses of the world and, and having our lives, our homes, being emotionally hospitable, intellectually hospitable, practically hospitable, and, and, and welcoming people into our lives, being gatekeepers in the inclusive sense. And again, inviting people uh, into opportunities and spaces to be seen and known and loved in the fullness of who they are. Now, there's one other, well, not one other, there's many in this, but a chapter that resonated with me, uh, and especially it gets back to our gotcha culture, mm -hmm. feel wronged. Um, what role does forgiveness play? How can we practice forgiveness, uh, Lexi? So. 
it's it's hard, you know. I'm part Irish, and I joke that you know it's easier to hold. hold I think it's in my blood easier to hold grudges than to let things go. And and you know, this is where storytelling can come into play. That it's, it can be easy to feel to tell ourselves a story that um, that there there that we are holding on to power by holding on to grudges, you know, and maintaining, maintaining memories of, of past grievances. And, and, but actually what if we sw switch that story and tell ourselves a different story that actually, you know, there's power in forgiveness. There's, we, we, we get power over our lives or agency, or we reclaim our emotional wealth it, instead of having like, you know, anger and, and resentment drain us of our energy that we regain our power, regain strength, and, and forgiving and moving on and not being held captive by the past. And that's been a really interesting area of exploration for me and an opportunity for me to, um, to challenge myself to forgive more freely, more readily, that there is no power to be had and hang on to bitterness and, and resentment. And that also forgiveness doesn't mean, you know, politely sweeping difference under the rug. It does mean justice. You know, it does mean confrontation and, and in an ideal world, reconciliation, and restitution, but that's not always possible. And in areas where that's not possible, we can, you know, do our part to pursue justice, to speak truth to power, to confront people with, with the injustice, the hurt they've caused, while also not being, not being punished, not allowing ourselves to continue to be punished and held captive by the past. And, and, you know, forgiveness doesn't have to be two ways. It can just be one way and we can be freed to, you know, lead our full lives, be our best selves by not, you know, we can reclaim our power by not being held captive to the past. And another element of uh, you allude to, just to clarify about forgiveness is removing the burden from oneself, um, uh, I'll, you know, and um, forgiving as a means of moving on. And, but as you just said, it's not a matter of sweeping it under the rug. It's freeing yourself. Yeah, yeah exactly. Great. Now we can, we are racing along in our show today and we can keep on going, but I have to, uh, as you know, I ask every guest a story about grace and, fr and frankly, your entire book is about grace. Do you have a special story or uh, example you'd like to share with us? Uh, Lexi? I uh, do. You know, my daughter, being a mother, is an exercise in grace. Being a parent is an exercise in grace day in, day out. You know, that we have to be, um, and, and, and it's a dual, a, 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 there's a duality to, to grace, a duality of obligation to, you know, show grace freely and receive it freely as well. And parent and parenthood teaches, teaches us in both ways. You know, our kids, they don't listen. They have to be told the same thing a million times. They, um, you know, they they do what they want to do and not what you want them to do. Like, you, know, you just have to, they make mistakes, right? Like, they, you just have to freely show grace. But, you know, as a parent, I'm imperfect too, and I fall short day in, day out, time and time again. I remember this one, there's this one time that will haunt me maybe forever that, you know, I love to cook with my kids. We're always doing kind of hands-on activities, doing experiments, mixing, making ingredients. And um, we just have a lot of fun in the kitchen together. That's our kind of craft time. And one day I was cracking eggs with my baby girl and, you know, she's, their kids are, she's two, right? Like my kids are advanced. They're, they're, they're curious. And, um, you know, but, but so, so I gave her a egg and she just kind of held it in her hands and like was like huh what's happening and she cracks it in her hands and it makes a big mess all over the place and it's really incredible you know i look back on how i reacted and i'm not proud of it it's like my lizard brain was activated and it was just like kind of the straw that broke the camel's back and my body interpreted this small innocent act as if she had done this on purpose to make another mess for me to clean up and it was just one more thing to do i said you know, I was very stern. I said, Sophia, why did you do that? Like as if she meant to hurt me. Of course she didn't at all. Right. She was too, just being curious and we were doing an activity together. And you know, that really affected her. And I said, okay, let's clean it up. So I clean it up and I said, okay, let's try again. Okay. And I gave her an egg and she literally stood up and ran away. She's like, I am not touching that egg again. And like to this day, that was back in, oh my goodness, February, March, April, it's been two months and she still won't crack eggs with me. Two months like that, that is an exercise in, you know, my gracelessness having consequences. Thankfully, like this is the beautiful thing about being a mother in the same way that, 
it, 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 it takes, we have to positively reinforce good behavior on our kids. You know, we have to remind them, do this many times, that um, thankfully our mistakes, our one-off errors, our, our lapse in judgment, losing our patience, those don't irreparably destroy, you know, children either. You know, like it, it, kids are resilient and beautiful and so wonderful. But, you know, just the, the times where I fall short, my kids show me grace, I'm just endlessly, endlessly thankful for it. So we're, we're getting to the point again with baby girl where, where she is, you know, able to crack eggs but like that just that story stays with me that like you know i need to have, be, have just like ample grace as a parent and and the times where i don't like uh i'm just so grateful for the kids that with the time that the kids show me grace and, and show me forgiveness too uh, what a wonderful story <laughs> and you tell it uh so eloquently and you you, you actually throw yourself under the bus there uh, lexi uh, but i will say and that element there that grace is a thread throughout your book because your book is not an admonishment. It's a welcoming. It is a joy to read because it is so full of um, stories and history and philosophy, but in bite-sized chunks that uh, with real world advice that just all comes together. It's a wonderful package, the soul of civility. Um, Alexandra Houston, how can people find you? So. Join, join me at Civic Renaissance, civic-renaissance.com. It's my newsletter and publication dedicated to beauty, goodness, and truth. If you sign up, I have lots of free resources and gifts I'd like to share with you, such as a, a mini course called Greek Mythology in 10 Minutes. So please do uh, enjoy, come over there and enjoy and keep learning, keep talking about these ideas, keep keep going along alongside me and a community of 50,000 people across the world who care about being agents of social healing in our world today. It's uh, I've been a true, uh, excuse me, a wonderful um, honor to have you on the show, Alexandra Houston. And with that, we will go out.